All right, I think we're going to get started. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the Berkman Kind Center and to the Institute for Rebooting Social Media. Thank you all so much for being here. It's so lovely to see some more familiar faces, but also some new faces, or at least new to me. Um, for those who don't know me, my name is Tony Gardner, and I'm a program manager with Berkman's Institute for Rebooting Social Media. Uh, so it's my pleasure to introduce our moderator for today's event, Youngjin Park. Dr. Park is a professor at the School of Communications at Howard University, working on the effects of emerging technologies as they relate to social and policy problems. Um, a member of our institute's uh, inaugural visiting scholar cohort, uh, Young's current research focuses on AI, algorithmic bias, personal data, and digital in inequalities. Thank you, Young. Uh Thank you. Thank you, Tony, for the kind introduction. And thank you for everyone uh, for showing. I mean, uh, this event is uh, making possible because of the audit and Tony, Kujo, and uh, JG, and uh, James Mickens, and then Nick, and everyone actually kindly helped. And I'm so glad that uh, this one actually is happening today. Uh, so, uh, Dr. Newman, if I introduce uh, his work, uh, he has a uh, 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 in-rich intellectual background. Uh, he's coming from the uh, Berkeley. Uh, and I heard that uh, when he uh, got accepted in Berkeley uh, sociology program, one of the acceptance letters actually came from the telegram, uh, not the email or anything like that. So how much actually technology has since then actually changed. And that's a fascinating story. And he actually went to the world of school and then Right now, it is at the NYU Shanghai. And uh, as you can see, this book is over the last few decades, uh, Dr. Newman actually produced actually coming from the uh, mass communication, political communication, and new technology. And then last book was Digital Differences, which is a fascinating book. Now, this uh, going into the new book, which is the topic of uh, today's conversation. And then when I actually put together my uh, slide, it was not actually ready, the cover image. So <laughs> I found out just a few days ago, the new cover, which reminds me of uh, Steven Spielberg's uh, old movie, E.T. There is, there is a, a, a child, 1982, uh, I watched that movie. So uh, it's a nice book uh, title and cover. Uh, history between uh, Dr. Newman and I, we met at the communication department at the Michigan uh, University of Michigan. Uh, even before that, I mean, we had a pretty nice uh, Korean gang of follow of the Dr. Newman. And even before that, I got actually introduced the future of mass audience actually written in 1991. And I got introduced by this book uh, by the, uh, the Andrew Goodwin uh, in San Francisco. It was one of the 1998. The first book actually I read about the mass communication and technology. And I got a class in that class, luckily. And then uh, unfortunately he passed away a few, day, a few years ago, but the resonating a lot of things about how Dr. Newman's book and his actual introduction of his book was still guiding a lot of things about uh, my work, my work. So before I go, before I go, one of the last things resonate uh, with me about his work, Dr. Newman's work is that uh, in the future of the mass audience, it uh, starts with one story about World War II, how much European actually destroyed by the World War II. But they had an opportunity to actually rebuild all the system anew but what the Dr. Yuma is saying, instead of rebuilding the system entirely new, despite the opportunity, they actually rebuild the system exactly the same way, same crooked road, same old fashioned way the system, because they missed what they actually lost because of the war. So that resonates a lot of things that uh, what we think about new technology, how it should be designed. So for that, uh, I actually welcome. Dr. Newman, for his introduction of the new book. Thank you. Uh, my plan is to speak uh, relatively briefly and take advantage of our informal setting here. And, and you're munching on your lunch. Think of some things that you'd like to raise. Uh, I'd like to just basically, uh, I'm not going to use PowerPoints. I'm going to speak from some notes. Uh, I'd like to raise about 
Uh, I'm, I'm sure many of you have seen the back of the head of the speaker who is reading the bullet points to you off the screen and find that less than the ideal way of getting a conversation going. So I'll, I'll, I'll try to um, <laughs> resist PowerPoint dependence as a, a, a impediment for communication. Uh, and I'm going to start by asking you if you've heard the one about how paper clips are going to kill, kill us. Have you heard the AI? Well, we've got a couple of people about the paper clips. So uh, my, our colleague, Nick Bostrom at Oxford University, developed a scenario, I think with good intent. And the idea is if you generated a command to a all powerful, super smart AI system and said, make as many paper clips as possible, eventually that empowered agentic system would kill all human beings because it would intelligently figure out that the atoms that make up living human beings could be converted into paper clips. And since the only command that is running the system, so ultimately those paper clips will kill us. And uh, it seems like in such an exaggerated scenario, I'm sure that uh, Professor Bostrom's intent is to say, let's still pay attention to this, the extreme. And, and there's been basically every other day in at least the New York Times, there will be the AI, Syria is gonna kill us kind of uh, op-ed, but it's been, Two particularly demonstrable ones, one by uh, Noam Chomsky, another by um, uh, Harari and colleagues, uh, raising questions about the, uh, the potential threats of AI. And since I'm talking about the future and the next generation of AI, uh, I take note of this tradition. I respect that I think we need to be very careful about the potential uh, challenge, negative challenges of AI. Uh, I'll conclude with my particular view of that. But the rest of my presentation is gonna say, let's for the next half hour, adopt a view to say, let's think through what the positive effects could be of next generation idea, uh, AI, and work toward that ideal and think kind of, how would that actually work out if, and this is the central concept of my book, the concept of evolutionary intelligence is based on this kind of uh, metaphoric notion that well, uh, wheels made us more mobile, uh, machines made us stronger, telecom allowed us to communicate across the earth, and AI may actually make us smarter in practical ways in day to day, and not just for elites, but for every, every individual who wanna take advantage of it. If more or less uh, the great majority of human beings uh, have uh, mobile phones, many of them smartphones, I think ultimately we can see that controllable AI will be in the hands of a, a very large portion of, of the uh, population. And that could be a good thing. I point out that the term evolutionary intelligence doesn't put the intelligence in the human and doesn't put the intelligence in a robot or machine. It focuses on this underlying concept of evolution. So let me take just a minute to run, you've all heard various versions of this, but this is my version. I, I call it a language, land, leverage, and literacy. If you think about the stages with which the evolved um, primate humanoid uh, evolved cognitive system has survived while 99% of the species that have lived on earth have not survived, it's because of our capacity to adaptively find elements in our environment that we can use. And the first was uh, among ourselves language so we could pass on wisdom from one generation to the next. Language may be, uh, it started originally as a bunch of grunts and gestures and more formalized language with uh, the construction of being able to predict the future and talk about the past probably is about 100,000 years old. Uh, writing is only 10,000 years old, but language is the first. The second is moving beyond uh, hunting and gathering. And that's only, and we know a fair amount about this, uh, 10,000 years old. So for 90% of human existence as modern humans on earth, we were surviving in the grasslands and the forest by just picking up berries and chasing down small game. Um, 10,000 years ago, we discovered probably by chasing some animals into a canyon and, and figuring out a way to keep them there, how to actually domesticate animals and to take some seeds and purposely grows food. So farming and domesticated animals is literally only 10,000. And that permitted enough extra wealth that allowed for cities and larger social communities 
And before 10,000 years ago, human existence was pretty much families and very small uh, extended tribes. The Industrial Revolution a couple hundred years ago, uh, I use the word leverage, where we replaced wind and water power uh, and animal power with machine power. And then uh, finally, uh, uh, literacy. And this is what makes my version of this a little different than others. Uh, mass literacy with uh, the common individual able to read and write on their own is only 100 years uh, old. And uh, for those of you that pay attention to this kind of global patterns, right now the uh, global literacy rate for humans is in the 80s and 90%. So it's, we really have now come to an age where we can expect that uh, human communication can be well beyond just uh, uh, verbal exchanges. So let's take a look at what uh, AI can do now. And I focus on uh, what it's good at. And uh, my version of this is there are three things that's, that the current generation of AI is good at. The first is pattern recognition. Uh, and that's what leads to the capacity for generative uh, technologies and large language models. Uh, and then uh, it's pretty good so far at the SLAM robotics. SLAM is the capacity to uh, locate yourself and at simultaneous mapping of where you are at motion. We think of it in terms of the uh, self-driving cars, uh, which is a focus of a great deal of research currently in applying uh, AI. So uh, pat pattern recognition, generative language models, and, and uh, SLAM robotics. Um, what we all pretty much agree on is that it's, it's a somewhat awkward term, AGI, or artificial general intelligence. This is the term, the, the acronym that's now used for human-like intelligence. And my view of what the future of AI is that we are going to have a variation of AGI, especially if we can define it in terms of a co-pilot and not pilot, that is an advisory service to human behavior rather than handing over control of our environment to some kind of uh, machine uh, system. And I, to, I emphasize the importance of the stage we are at I focus on the fact that the concept of artificial intelligence was invented in the mid 1950s. And it isn't until 70 years later that we really start to see examples of the artificial intelligence that was imagined 70 years ago. And the question is what was lacking in the technology and the environment that prevented a real artificial intelligence from being demonstrated for 70 years, despite a great deal of, of effort. And I think there are three impediments we can identify. And thinking about them, I think is helpful for understanding the fourth, which is the focus of uh, my uh, research. Uh, the first was we didn't have uh, sufficient computing power. Turns out that large language models require real uh, heavy metal, uh, uh, big iron. And uh, one of the reasons OpenAI uh, decided to work closely with Microsoft was access to Microsoft's extended uh, server farm network uh, and capacity to generate the spectacular computing power that they've been putting to work. Uh, the second thing was we didn't have access to accessible large language databases uh, in the 1950s, 60s, and 70s. We didn't have what is available now, uh, largely based on the internet, but from other sources as well. Um, and, and the third was we didn't have a mathematical, a set of mathematical tools that could make sense of parameterized prediction models that have 175 billion parameters. I mean, we just didn't have, and the notion of layered neural nets and the last 20 years of research has developed probably about a dozen mathematical models that help us make sense. So the math, the data, and the computer power together generated what we're at at the current level. And somehow what that's missing is the next step for something that would be close to hopefully approaching in a positive way, AGI. And my argument about what the next step needs to be is a way of dealing with an unstructured data set. If you think about the P in a GPT, it, the P stands for pre-trained. Generative pre-trained transformer. Transformer is just the name for a, one of those versions of a, a neural net uh, modeling system. Um, and my proposal is to pay attention to the work of my colleague, uh, Jan Lacoon, who is uh, running the FAIR research unit at META and is also a professor at NYU in our Quran Institute. 
And his model is, uh, has a different acronym. He's published a paper on this, uh, and I commend uh, his paper to your attention. Uh, it was published in June, I think, of last year, 2022. Uh, and it is a description of the JEPA model, J-E-P-A. And uh, the, JEP, the J-E is joint embedded, so that's not the key issue. The key issue is the P. So if the last P in GPA is for pre-trained. And the secret for the next generation, in my view, of uh, the next generation of AI is the predictive part of Jan LeCun's model. Now, what does he mean by predictive? He means that you can show a intelligent computational learning system a video of what's going on and say, what's gonna happen next? And so if you've got a video stream, you don't have to label what happens next. What happens next is in the video. So you don't have to have now the key, the secret sauce, and uh, Altman and Brockman and the others at OpenAI freely admit this, that part of the secret sauce is um, reinforcement learning with human feedback. So they have a lot of individuals responding to a version of uh, a, a generative phenomenon and saying, I like the second answer, not the first answer. And that's one of the things that generated the sense of humanity, humanness uh, that people sense when they're dealing with these uh, chat uh, technologies. So uh, the next stage, the notion that we could label every possible corner of the trillions and trillions of uh, elements of knowledge. And here's what fascinates me about Lacoon's model, which is he said, if you think about how uh, an infant learns about the world around them, the mother isn't always labeling this and that. The infant knows that if it drops something, it falls to the ground and it begins to understand the physics of the environment by touching and interacting. And the argument is we can build a JEPA model that would have the kind of world knowledge that's missing. If you think of Cyril's Chinese room model about how intelligent systems can translate to Chinese, but they don't have any idea what they really said, the notion that AI can make it sound like without really understanding the logic and the world basis on which these language is mimicking. That's why the word, and they use it freely, mimicking these uh, transformative uh, technologies that are mimicking language they've heard. Sounds like a human, but doesn't reflect real understanding. Uh, my view is that the JEPA model will permit that. So uh, I think that the next challenge is going to be what is going to be the interface between real working humans and the capacity of these technologies to better uh, understand the environment and provide advice on our environment to us as we systematically misperceive the environment. So if you say evolutionary intelligence, what's the key idea? The key idea is that these technologies can be compensatory and compensate for the relatively well understood limitations of the human cognitive system and the built in biases of the human cognitive system. What was beneficial for survival when we had clubs and maybe uh, stones as resources for us? Uh, in the grasslands and the jungles uh, may not be the same that will serve us well in the modern environment. So if you think about uh, Kahneman and Tversky's notion, they call it in a formal way prospect theory, about half a dozen, maybe a dozen known systematic biases and misrepresenting risk and future developments that probably were uh, beneficial to survival in uh, hunting and gathering days and clearly not beneficial for our survival. Kahneman got the Nobel Prize from economics because they realized understanding human biases and representing risk and reward, systematic errors in understanding our environment is something that might benefit from uh, correction. And I'm thinking these technologies can provide it. How would it work practically? Here, my central concept is, and I've got an entire chapter on this in the book, convergence. Computers used to be big, tube-based machines. In fact, the Aiken computer was just across the walkway here, one of the first computers in, uh, in history. Uh, Air-conditioned uh, room-sized computers, and then, of course, mainframes, and then, of course, uh, smaller uh, individual computers, lap uh, desktops, laptops. Right, right now, we're at smartphones and smartwatches. 
And this convergence is merging towards, and I'm arguing that ultimately, despite some very shaky background in Google Glass, that glasses and smart contact lenses and other ways in which uh, the technology can provide information to the individual confronted with a real world situation. Uh, I think the ultimate convergence is going to be wearables and that the definition of what is and is not a computer is going to be almost an impossible task as intelligence migrates, converges from a distant box to the environment of the individual. Uh, I expand upon this and say, when you walk into a room, you'll note that evolution gave you the capacity to hear and to see, but evolution didn't give you the capacity to receive and interpret radio waves. So, well, it turns out that if you go into a room, you've got a smartphone and a few other things, and you're probably communicating with this other range of uh, electromagnetic spectrum to the world. My notion is that we're increasingly going to, when we come into a, a room or an environment, we will communicate our existence through a prearranged identity that's electronic, not just visual. And we, we'll look back at, at the crudeness of having to use facial identification of our, our facial. And the key to making this not an invasion of our privacy is the individual's own control over how they represent themselves with their electronic envelope. If you think about the clothes you choose to wear, the demeanor you choose behaviorally, the language you use choose, which will be differential in different kinds of environment, each of those is a way in which you are presenting yourself. Uh, my proposal is your electronic envelope will be under your control and you can present as much or as little or head towards the avatar side of things as you choose uh, when you enter an environment electronically. Uh, key to making this work is a, a set of rules of engagement. Uh, I'll give you the example that I think is, uh, I think the st strongest and perhaps most promising, and I call it, uh, and I had a chance to talk with Jung this morning about it, something I call intelligent privacy. Uh, think about, uh, this is quoting uh, Yuval Harari, how many people have taken the most valuable personal information they've got and given it away in order to watch free funny cat videos? I've done a couple of calculations. One that's easiest to remember is that your personal information as a denizen of the online world is worth about, if you add up all of the advertisements that have been sent to you and kind of divide the number of people that are active, it's about $1,000 a year. That's the value of all the different ads that have been sold to get access to your attention. And I say, let's take that 1,000 and split it, 500 for you and 500 for the other companies and generate a capacity They say, look, I'm into privacy. I don't want my $500. I don't want anybody to know anything. I'm Let's set up a system so I'm uh, on an anonymous basis and I can do my transactions. And after that, every, all the information is erased. Okay, and you don't get your $500 and they don't get the advertising benefit. If you say, I, I'm going to make all my, if, some, if I like chocolate and I buy size nine sneakers, I don't mind if anybody knows that. Then those advertisements go out, they sell the sneakers. The thousand dollars is spent, and you get contractually five hundred dollars, and the other companies to motivate their participation in intelligent privacy. And you've got the ultimate control. And when you don't care, and when you would just assume that the chocolate companies know you're available and want to sell you information on the latest uh, chocolate con confection that you might be interested in, you'd be delighted to be contacted by them. Um, so. People talk about one particular dimension of the disadvantage of the next generation of AI and other technologies, and that is the atrophy of human capacities by dependence on other technologies. Uh, my view is that uh, this is again under our control. And for those that are inclined to defer to others to take care of or make all the decisions for them, that the atrophy is not a necessary or natural outcome of the use of strengthening our capacity, it's like saying, uh, I'd rather walk than drive. And when it's convenient, you do that. And I talk about how we used to be dependent on horses. And now when we go to the stables to go for a nice trail ride, we take a car to the parking lot next to, we don't use horses anymore. We've got a new way of doing things. Will human beings take good advice if it's offered to them? I pause for emphasis because I see that as the ultimate challenge that I and others are working on, which is finding a way. So one way of putting it, we've got some pretty good HCI. 
HCI is the acronym for human computer interaction or human computer interface. And I'm saying the next challenge will be coming up with an HCI for AI in which we find a way to formulate advice so humans will evaluate it and when it's good advice, they'll take it. My model for this is twofold and it involves cars. When your uh, automatic sensor beeps and says you're getting too close to the curve of the car in front of you, you generally respond. You say, I've come to know that I'm going to hit that car if I don't pay attention to that beep. Most people have found it to be in their interest to respond to a red light by stopping. Not all, but at their peril are those that say, I'm just going to scream through that red light and, and pay no attention whatsoever. And we've come to say sometimes Waze gives us advice to save two minutes. And Waze is going to do its algorithm and say, if you take these 15 left and right turns on these back roads, I can save you two minutes. And you say, I don't, it's not worth 15 left and right turns to save two minutes. Thank you very much, Waze. I'll just go the longer way. And you begin to negotiate with when you're going to take the advice of this optimization. And what's not yet happened is you haven't yet got the chance to inform ways that mm, for, for 15 left and right turns, I don't want to save two minutes, which you can easily program into ways as well. Right now, we're at the stage where you have to learn when you will and will not take the advice from your, uh, your, your car advisor. Uh, I said I would end with uh, a question about what my primary concern about the future of uh, maladaptive or, or uh, malicious AI is, and it's not the technology. It's the control of that technology. And I think uh, those in government interested in protecting their power and those in industry interested in protecting their profit margins have every incentive to distort the design of these systems in such a way that our challenge is not in regulating mathematical algorithms. It's in regulating the social and legal and normative environment in which those algorithms are displayed and, and put to work. So I think the challenge is to us and that it's maybe a little more optimistic than your mood might provide on this rainy day in Cambridge, uh, that AI can literally be the savior of those humans who relying on instincts that were useful when we did battle with clubs, will rely on those same instincts when we can rely on nuclear weapons and shouldn't. And that the capacity of uh, our intelligence systems to remind us what the long-term costs of uh, aggression and violent acts and maladaptive behavior are, uh, can literally lead to uh, making us Smarter. Thank you very much. I thought I'd end early, and I did. So let's uh, let's turn this into a discussion. I'm hoping uh, some of my optimism provoked you, and so we'll take the grumpiest first. So going back, uh, my background to ecology for context. Humans were really stable for a very very long time as a species, like hundreds of thousands of years, arguably going back to the bacteria. It's really the development of writing that kind of destabilized us, right? Because then we get ledgers, economies, cities start growing. There's an alternative view of this is that it's not that technology saved us, but it's actually a destabilizing force that creates a positive feedback loop that's destroying the environment and maybe global warming. And it feels a little hard to frame that destabilizing positive feedback as, as a, a force for good. Um, and not something that needs to be kind of controlled and balanced. And the assumption that the next technology would be the one that stabilizes it feels over optimistic, maybe? If that makes any sense? Okay. So my, argue, my argument is that perhaps the technology provides an opportunity for destabilization. It's up to us to find the norms and to do the programming and to do the corrections when we see that a particular set of algorithms is leading to racist or hateful speech. Uh, there was a piece uh, yesterday in uh, the Wall Street Journal that said Bing is intentionally boring. Or was it, um, I mean, it was Bard that was intentionally, it was Bard that was intentionally boring. Uh, and the idea is uh, already within a couple of weeks of some of these releases, we've gotten some um, humans in the loop 
uh, reinforcement learning to generate correctives for uh, part of the more provocative elements of the GPT 3.5. Uh, it's it's not the technology, uh, it's the use of the technology. So let's let's talk about the, the rules of the road, the rules of engagement, um, the legal environment in which this takes place. Please. Yes. So um, I want to ask about... I want everybody to know he's smiling. I'm not sure what he's about to say, but at least he's smiling. This is a good start. <laughs> this is the second grumpiest guy. No, no, I'm... Uh... Uh, I, I want to ask the, about the personal aspect of uh, what you said, the, the model, which I completely uh, share that, uh, you know, if it's worth $1,000, take 500 for the, the chip in the uh, contact lens and, uh, and the other 500 for others. And my question is to get from here to there, where the contact lens and the chip are pretty clear now what they're going to look like. Uh, can we, as a species, from your perspective, as an evolutionary process, tolerate the AI being proprietary, for profit, or otherwise regulated through these political means that you yourself don't trust? And that's the grumpy part of, of if you want to look at my smile. In other words, does all of this have to be open source as education and literacy is open source or medicine is open source? Uh, and isn't that just as essential as the chip and the contact lens uh, interface? Okay, uh, your question generates a set of possible responses. One is the issue of transparency. So we understand something about how these models work so we can respond to them. The other is the technical term open source, which means the actual source code is available and and ultimately, generative sense. I mean it in the sense of education being generative, not the transparency. Okay. Um, my part of my reaction to that, and I'm smiling now, is I am stunned with to what extent companies like Meta and Google and Microsoft have published technical articles on the underlying math of net neural nets so that other people can share the transformer concept made public, used by others. The underlying math, um, Jan LeCun, who is uh, a, the, a primary lead in AI research for Meta, is publishing the basic math of his uh, 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 Jet, JEPA project. Uh, so there's a lot that's being shared for scientific advantage, uh, I think, uh, about the underlying math that makes these work. You'll notice that open AI is called open, but they have been less than fully public about what were the databases they used for creating it? And uh, what are the details of the way in which they've done the with some of the weighting functions? But the underlying logic of this is clear. And my uh, response to your question is doing, if I'm correctly uh, characterizing your question and, and, and comment, can we afford to tolerate a bunch of commercially run and proprietary systems to get to a good point? And the answer is, I think what we're going to see is a competition between some more open and accessible systems and some proprietary systems. And it'll be interesting to see whether some of these more uh, literally open source uh, models will be even more successful than the proprietary ones in some case. So I think what we're going to have to tolerate, since I don't think it's possible to outlaw proprietary AI in, in total, that what we want to see is a really interesting arms race between the open and proprietary systems to see which ones uh, turn out to be more successful. I'm delighted that the speech of Altman and Brockman and others at OpenAI still talks about trying to make as much of this uh, public. And when they argue that they're sending out betas that they know are gonna make mistakes, they say, I'm putting this out for general use for the general public because we want feedback and what we've done wrong. So I think there's there's a kind of a middle ground between proprietary and open source, and I hope um, I hope that some mixture of the two generates the, the goal we want to work towards. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I love the fact that you compare and you predicted Jeffa, I think. Yeah. Yeah. To to child development and child development especially. So I I love the fact. So my question is: as people, humans are born, they learn. And then they die. Do, is there 
humans are born, yes. they learn, okay. they grow up, yeah. and then they die. Is there a point where we're going to see the death of uh, as they evolve? We're going to see the death of the AI? So because here's the metaphor is if humans are born and die, will AI die? And my response to that challenging, a little bit grumpy question of, by raising the issue of, of inevitability death is that humans are uh, implementations of the human genome and, and human culture, and the culture proceeds beyond the existence of the individual life. And uh, GPT 3.5 will be replaced by GPT 4. And right now they're joking that GPT 10 will have 100 trillion parameters, which comes from the notion that our brains with 100 trillion synapses can understand and learn from natural learning processes our world. So the individual models will be built and the individual AI models will die, but the concept of artificial intelligence will not. Nick. Hi, uh, thank you for the talk. Um, I was curious about two, uh, or the sort of bookends that you, you had. Um, you seem optimistic that world models and prediction as sort of the basis of common sense um, might produce some sort of form of intelligence that is maybe not fully analogous to human intelligence, but along the path there. But then you also ended the talk by saying maybe not to worry too much about rogue super intelligence AI systems. And I was wondering how you square the circle there, because at least to me, it seems like those stances might be a little bit in tension. Okay, uh, I'm going to need to figure out what you were thinking of when you used the word rogue. Let me come up with two for fun. We're just talking here, right? We're just riffing. <laughs> um, there is a model of called superintelligence and the takeoff function. When AI systems start programming themselves, uh, our friend uh, Max uh, Tegmark from uh, MIT uh, has an extended introduction to his book, Life 3.0, where he talks about the Omega Project, where a private company over a holiday weekend starts a smart computer that programs itself twice on Saturday, 17 times on Sunday, and a trillion times on Monday, and rules the world by Tuesday. This is the Omega Project, the beginning of his book about how the computer can take over and have all the agencies and do everything. That's a rogue computer, and it's based on the explosion, knowledge explosion notion, the self-programming notion that it will go rogue because it's not listening to you anymore, it's programming itself. And personally, maybe somebody can explain it to me. I have been struggling with that for two years. I don't understand without feedback from an external world, how a program can program itself better the next time without any feedback, which means it takes time for these systems to evolve because as it takes time for an infant who has to spend the first three months of its life trying to decide what, where does the infant that I am stop and the world outside start? That takes three months for us to figure out. So I, I, I am not a, uh, a true believer in the knowledge explosion model that many of our colleagues, and in that case, the rogue is that the computer says, I'm no longer gonna listen to the input from the human. And I'm saying that could happen, but I think the much more likely thing to happen is a rogue capitalist rather than a rogue machine. Yeah. Thank you so much for the talk. This is really interesting. I'm curious, I wanna follow up a little bit on sort of that idea of birth, lifetime, death. And the reason that I'm, that, I, that I'm thinking about this is really about sort of what we've seen increasingly is the presentism that is baked in to so much of both the training sets and the, the algorithms, how they are run and the, even the feedback that that exists very much in a present tense. Um, training sets we've seen have, for the most part, run across internet provided materials. We don't see a lot of cultural heritage materials, for example, being baked in. We don't see a lot of um, sort of non-English language, some, but not a lot. But I'm not gonna go on the geography bit there. I'm really thinking right now about this, this occupying the present tense. And so I'm curious as to your thoughts, when you start to talk about the human in the loop, I th there is a presentism to that particular gesture 
that doesn't necessarily think of a generational impact or a multi-generational impact. And in some ways now, looking from the perspective of us looking back to the industrial revolution and looking at our current uh, um, environmental crisis, I'm just curious, how do you square that? How do you move past that embedded presentism in this, in, in AI? As you were speaking, I was thinking about this term digital natives, the notion that people who've grown up in a digital world are different human beings. Are, are, are you, is, is that something part of? I don't believe in it. <laughs> I was going to say, I don't believe. I don't, I don't think there is such I, I, I don't either. I think yeah. the, we are the evolved human cognitive system and we're higher wired to do a bunch of things. And I think uh, they could, the digital natives can tumble with their thumbs a lot better than I can. They may have a set of expectations, socially, culturally reinforced expectations that they want things to respond faster. But I think we are still the same evolved human cognitive system and that hasn't changed in 400,000 years meaningfully. Uh, so what we've got to do is assume that the, the basic human phenomenon are, are true. And, and when you say, is there data, historical and cultural data that could be added to these databases, uh, my hope is that they, the demonstration of diversity of sources generates a better decision system, that that incentive will lead to a much broader set of inputs into these materials. Right now, we're not sure where uh, OpenAI got all its stuff. Uh, and uh, eventually, I think that information will become more and more known. And the competing systems will start to say, use my system because the basis of my system is a more diverse set of, of of training experiences. And that will prove to be better because diversity of origin material has dem demonstrated again and again to be a better, a better basis for precision. Hi. Yeah, um, I really enjoyed your comment about um, advice and humans taking advice. Um, but one of the main features of, of the current state of the technology is that some of these models are very good at providing very bad advice that sounds like very sound advice. And um, despite the literacy levels is keeping up and almost being 90% these days, um, I wonder whether we're equipping next generations with enough critical thinking skills to differentiate good from bad advice or you know, a fake uh, image or video from a, one that's not. And I, I, I wonder what your thoughts are about the dangers or the limitations that that education system um, may create. Uh, I have two things I like to say about that. I mean, I, I tend to draw on historical metaphors. Um, when we invented the automobile, the, for example, the Model T, you had to adjust the spark a little bit at the, at the, at the adjustment of the spark was at the wheel. You run around to the front of the car and you start cranking like this. And if it gets going, you run back to the wheel and get, you think of, and then of course you had to have goggles on because all the dirt, the roads were not made for that. So I, I, we're at the Model T stage of chat. GPT and the fact that um, uh, Watson thought that Toronto wasn't in Canada, and I mean, the, and we tend to focus on some of the more blatant mistakes that some of these early systems make. I think they're correctable, and however, I find the final statement you made one which I warmly and enthusiastically agree, which is teaching humans critical thinking skills, which turns out to be hard might be enhanced by finding ways in which we can demonstrate the benefit of critical thinking skills in these models so that the combination of, you know what happened when Kasparov lost to uh, Big Blue? Kasparov came back the next month and said, I wanna show you a demonstration that a human and a computer working together will beat a computer. And hats off for Kasparov for doing that. And that I love that, it's that story. And my argument is that uh, with appropriately uh, designed resources, uh, humans can then be taught and find the benefit of critical thinking skills. I'm from biology department and from the plant side. In plants and fungi, I thought I should speak loud. No, we just got them. <laughs> I'm from plant biology department on campus. In plants and fungi, we know at least there are more than 1 million species and often we struggle to identify unknown species. And we often make a joke. 
probably one day the AI will determine all these correct identifications. That's what we among biologists often think about it. So now, as you know, human beings, they want to live longer. And the longevity is determined by the structure in the chromosome. And cell biologists, I'm not a cell biologist, but cell biologists have been working on it. So now, do you know that artificial intelligence is being applied in any way to enhance the longevity of human beings? Uh, this is well beyond my expertise. I, I've read the popular re reports that AI is particularly good at uh, chromosome folding modeling uh, and quantum computing is particularly good at some of the complexities of understanding uh, uh, the folding dynamics. Uh, I, I simply am unable to respond whether that is or is not clearly connected to the issue of longevity. Um, but we're looking forward to your magical, magical re results of your research so that longevity becomes a, a human option rather than a predetermined uh, 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 and much too soon result. Are there some questions from um, uh, our, our guests online? That's what I wanted to, to share with you. There's a few comments online. I'm going to uh, pick one of the questions here. There's questions about governance, a question about uh, pro this project being uh, dead on arrival, but I'll just read this one. Wait a minute. Dead on, my project <laughs> is dead on arrival? No, no, no. no. The, the, the project of uh, AGI. Uh, oh, AGI. Okay. Right. All right. Fair. fair. Uh, evolution does indeed seem to be the ultimate challenge when it comes to taking good advice. In a sense, expertise is a form of artificial intelligence in relationship in relation to the person who doesn't possess it. And uh, we've seen what's happened in recent years when it comes to larger numbers of people's ability to evaluate and take good advice from such artificial intelligence. How can we not simply repeat our past failures to properly evaluate and take good advice? when it comes to artificial, artificial intelligence. Okay, uh, you, you'll see that my term evolutionary intelligence blurs the notion between human and, or, and machine intelligence. And so I, I was expecting to have the classic question for people in my field, which is, well, what's intelligence? And my definition of intelligence is correctly receiving, receiving feedback from your environment so that you can correctly adjust your behavior to meet your goals. If you look at the book, these, these books that I've been citing, uh, Ted Mark and Bostrom and Stuart Russell, all of them start out with a definition of intelligence pretty close to that. And so uh, <laughs> intelligence is correctly interpreting the signals from your environment. And if a machine helps us do that better, and we want to correctly interpret the, the uh, signals from our environment, I give an example in the book of somebody who's arguing with an individual with which they ultimately disagree. It's a neighbor who is politically on this, probably a red-blue thing, right? Uh, Trump and a non-Trump. Uh, and the advisor advises the liberal saying, if you give that advice to your Trumpy neighbor with all the statistics and all the elite opinions, you're not gonna have any success in changing that person's mind and they are going to be angry and frustrated. And the advice comes and the guy says, no, nah, I'm going to do it anyways and somehow take a, uh, a pleasure in making my neighbor angry because I'd rather have conflict than uh, confront. And humans may well choose to take an advantage. They just find perverse or other pleasures in, in ignoring good advice. Um, uh, many of us uh, will find cases of entertainment or something like that and we choose not to do that. Hopefully, each of those occasions becomes a learning experience for ourselves. And uh, I see emphasizing the co-pilot, not pilot. We're not handing over agency to these technologies, in, in my uh, proposition. We're taking advice from them when we choose to. And one more question uh, from Helen. Uh, the Royal Society recently published a meta-analysis of genetic evolution versus cultural co-evolution in humans, with the conclusion being that the balance has tipped towards cultural coevolution over pure genetics. What impact will advanced uh, uh, large language models have on our cultural evolution? Uh, my favorite in this tradition is uh, Tomasello's work, uh, a psychologist talking about the evolution of, of, of uh, the evolution of human capacities, emphasizing just that point about cultural change being much more dramatic than genetic change, uh, physical change in humans. Um, the short answer to the question, will uh, AI, the question was formed in terms of generative, particularly. 
Uh, I see generative as just one part of a much broader set of work. It, when, uh, when Kasparov played Big Blue and when uh, Watson went on Jeopardy, we talked about it for a year. It was a big dramatic single event. Um, when uh, Altman and others at OpenAI are asked, will this be the, the changing event? Is 3.5 the event? Is Chad GPT the event? The argument they make, and it's the argument I make, this is a continuous development and that I don't think any single event is going to be a, a turning point. And that among a series of other technical developments uh, and cultural developments, uh, we're going to see dramatic change in our culture, hopefully for the, for the plus side. Um, two part question. Uh, if you are familiar with the, I saw that you worked at the OSDB. Um, if you've read their ethical AI guidelines, I'd love to just hear any feedback you have, either specifically or generally on them producing that. And then the second part is, um, you mentioned your main concern is about bad actors getting control of this technology. However, it's, it seems that there is, the people who are most likely to develop it are those bad actors, right? Large governments have the most resources. Large corporations have the most resources. The equation is large government equals bad actor. Or well, I guess I would love for you to get into that more. But like, it seems that um, you're going to have a lot of incentives by a lot of the uh, either firms or governments have the capability to produce these uh, kind of rogue AI systems. And how do you like concretely regulate that environment? If you have any thoughts. Um. Uh, I have a couple of quick one-liners. Let me just sort of share them with you. I, I think uh, regulating a tech, if somebody uses the telephone to call up somebody else to arrange a crime, you can't sue the telephone company for having facilitated a crime. And I sort of have that same sort of attitude. We're seeing a possible change of that. Section 230 of the 1996 Telecommunications Act protects uh, online uh, providers and social media from being held responsible for people that say bad things on their platforms. And that's currently under review at the Supreme Court. So we may see a major change in the way in which uh, conveyances become held responsible for those that use the conveyance for something that's malicious. Um, my one-liner is when an, uh, an illegal act is, is conducted with the facilitation of a technology don't sue the technology, don't blame the technology, find a way when a malicious act has taken place, a murder or a robbery or something of that form, uh, you use the existing legal structure and traditions to persecute um, mal malicious behavior and uh, don't shoot the messenger. Um, my notion of defining and regulating AI is akin to trying to nail jelly to the wall. You can't do it. I don't think the use of mathematics to decide uh, decision processes for our understanding our environment is could be regulated. Uh, I am fascinated by the Open AI Act and its tradition in Europe uh, and its facilitation, hopefully, in Brazil. We'll see how that works out. Um, uh, the basic notion there is if you do something wrong, we're going to find you. And we'll see if that has an appropriate corrective event. Uh, I'm betting for getting the best net result, competition from multiple players. So the better systems end up being successful. And that those that have, you know, and there's a hint at the, that, that I might be right about this. And the hint is that the Chinese who have been putting, they say, $30 billion into AI research haven't been very, very successful so far on the transform, uh, transformers and um, and generative technologies. We'll see if the top-down control of research in that kind of an authoritarian environment just doesn't generate as good research and good, as good technology, uh, in which case uh, there's a natural environment that leads, leads the good guys to win. Uh, but we'll get back to your bad guys equals big government. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But any thoughts on the OSTP AI ethical guidelines? Uh, hopeful, um, sending an, a hopeful message uh, but the notion, and of course, uh, in, in the American context, you don't talk about regulation. Yeah. You talk about government partnerships with private enterprise. I, I've, I've been there. I know how to say it. <laughs> and my hopeful hope is that there will be some of that, and we'll experiment. 
And if a government private enterprise is successful because it competes better, has a better system, that's a win. And if a government managed system screws up, then okay. Hopefully the marketplace will still be able to make the distinction between which technology is working better. Uh, I guess time's almost uh, off. Uh, so one, one final comment to the moderator here that uh, one of the things about the intelligent privacy is uh, depending on how much we are also intelligent. So uh, empirical record actually suggests we are not. So I think that uh, uh, some of the concern that I kind of share that uh, at least privacy folks, they're not that smart. Uh, so. All right, so uh, Young's final word is, go ahead and give all, all your information to uh, uh, Surveilling capitalists and watch those funny cat videos and enjoy. That's that's you know, that's my version of what young kids so. said. Funny cat videos are good things, not to be critical. All right. Uh, uh, so for that, uh, I think that uh, we have time up. But if there is any further question, please uh, join uh, the Dr. Newman afterwards. And then thank you everyone uh, for coming. <laughs>